Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Historical Society. Uh, I know you haven't been here in a, quite a while. So uh, this is the uh, June um, 2021 annual program or monthly meeting. And uh, uh, I just want to say uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Kelly. I'm the uh, president now. And uh, uh, tonight's uh, speaker is uh, Rich Limburg. He's, uh, he's done like 20 books on, uh, on various things of history, including uh, gangster related stuff and Chicago history and uh, Chicago White Sox history. And I'm sure you're gonna love this program. And his uh, current book is uh, The Tales of Forgotten Chicago. Now, a couple other things I just wanna remind you about. Uh, next month, we'll be having the uh, Nord Park birthday party on uh, July 24th. Uh, you're all invited to come to that. Uh, and then on August 14th, we'll be having the, uh, our annual yard sale. And, uh, and if anyone can wants to volunteer for that, we're always looking for volunteers, even for uh, an hour time. It'll be three days from Thursday night, Friday, Saturday. So, uh, and hopefully you'll come out and buy some things too. And uh, another thing that uh, we have this Saturday is a kind of a kid's uh, little nature thing for kids from five to nine, year, nine years old that Diane Spenny is, uh, is hosting in the, in the garden out here for a couple hours. So if you have any little kids that wanna learn a little bit about nature, uh, have them come by. And uh, I also wanna thank everyone, anyone that donated to our annual appeal. Uh, we really appreciate that. It's, uh, it really helps out since last year, we didn't really have any fundraisers or anything. And uh, also uh, Father's Day is this weekend. So if you need to purchase anything for any uh, fathers out there, we have lovely gifts, you know, maps of Norwood, pens, t-shirts, golf balls, all kinds of things. So uh, uh, that's about it. So I'm just gonna turn it over to, to Rich and uh, and uh, and enjoy his uh, his show. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, thank you, Bob, and congratulations on uh, your election to the presidency of this worthy organization. It's been a great pleasure of mine to uh, uh, have appeared before the Nord Park Historical Society on numerous occasions. Um, as I look back on it, uh, I think the first time I spoke uh, was 1985. I had just published my third book called Chicago Ragtime. And I remember Anne's nodding, you were there. And I also remember that my kindergarten teacher from Onahan, Mrs. Hanneman was sitting in the first row. And I thought to myself, boy, I better make this one good. Uh, <laughs> And she was married to a police lieutenant, and I thought, I'm really going to be in trouble if I screw it up. But there she was, and she was nodding very grimly, and, uh, and that I did okay, and I was greatly relieved. Um, I published 20 books, and tonight I'm going to talk about one of them. And uh, I came up with the stories and wrote the book in my off hours, and a few of them uh, were uh, Alderman Burke's idea. Of course, the, one, of the, one of the concluding chapters is the uh, history of Special Olympics, which was founded by his wife, um, Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke. And uh, I had to include that story in the book. It's actually a very moving story. But in all my books that I write, uh, the fun part is the exploration and the discovery. And I think Stan will agree with that for the fine work he's done with his books. Uh, it really is a labor of love. And in some ways, I guess it's analogous to birthing a baby. Uh, you write a book and you bring it along month after month and you watch it grow and then it comes out. And then everything after it comes out is rather anticlimactic because inevitably you're disappointed with the lack of media coverage, with the lack of... Uh, praise you're going to get from your friends, especially if your friends don't want to read the book or are not interested, and even if your own family isn't interested, uh, which uh, <laughs> I can attest to. 
but uh, the joy is in the doing, and it's certainly not in the royalties, I can assure you. Anybody who wants to write a book, you're not going to get famous, and you're not going to make a whole lot of money, so move on to the stock market where you might even <laughs> fare better. But as Stan knows, we do it because we must, right? So um, I have a presentation uh, tonight, and uh, I have given this presentation to several other membership groups in the last year or so. Uh, I speak to a number of library senior associations uh, over the years uh, on subject matter ranging from the St. Valentine's Day massacre to the history of the Union stockyards. And yesterday I did a Zoom presentation on the famous Fall River, Massachusetts case on Lizzie Borden, the woman who took an ax and gave her father 40 wax. Um, <clears throat> that is a great old story. Um, my notes are prepared. And so I apologize, but I will read because I don't want to miss any of the details. And afterward, uh, please feel free to comment, or if you have any questions, I will endeavor to answer them. And uh, we'll move forward and I'll signal to you uh, when we change the slides. But, okay, that's okay. Um, the book begins in the Civil War era. Uh, it really spans about a hundred years of Chicago's history in its most formative period from the time of the Civil War up through uh, the 1960s. And the chapter, the concluding chapter is about the Beatles arriving in Chicago in 1964. And it really runs from uh, John Wilkes Booth to John Lennon. So that'll kind of give you um, an idea of how expansive the material is. Uh, as a historian with a fascination with President Lincoln and his tragic assassination in 1865, I was naturally curious to see what, if any connection, the assassin John Wilkes Booth might have had with Chicago. Foreshadowing the darkest tragedy in American history, Booth, this much admired young actor, graced the stage of McVicker's Theater in three lengthy sold out engagements with a resident stock company in 1862 and 1863. James McVicker, the man shown on the right, was a man of cheerful and sunny disposition, and he opened his famous old theater, the first McVicker's Theater, on November 3rd, 1857, on Madison Street between State and Dearborn. It was the first of three McVicker's Theaters to occupy that site until the final demolition of the third McVicker Theater, which many of you might remember, in 1984. In its day, the Playhouse earned praise as Chicago's premier theatrical venue. Next slide. In June 1867, 20-year-old Mary Runyon McVicker, James's daughter, played opposite the great Shakespearean actor Edwin Booth, whom you see on the left, in an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Edwin, later married uh, to Mary, was a renowned stage actor, but prone to fits of depression and recurring bouts of alcoholism. Coming from this tragically cursed family, it is perhaps understandable. Tragedy, like a dark star hovering in the sky, followed Edwin throughout his life. Mary took ill and died in New York City on November 13, 1881, on Edwin's birthday. His brother, John Wilkes Booth, the fanatical Southern sympathizer, was a good friend of James McVicker, but ended a career full of promise in 1864 to take up the Confederate cause and hatch the infamous murder plot that claimed the life of our 16th president at Ford's Theater. As a result of John's treachery, Edwin's reputation as the Sir Lawrence Olivier of his era was permanently scarred. Many occasions, he was booed off the stage or pelted with garbage from the audience. On April 23rd, 1879, when in the fifth act of Richard II at McVicker's Theater, a uh, deranged uh, man by the name of Mark Gray Lyon, seated in the gallery, arose from his seat, aimed his pistol and fired three shots at Booth, but the bullets missed their mark. Booth went on 
with his monologue that night, but after the curtain dropped, he removed the shell fragment that had been embedded in a wooden post. He later took it to a Chicago jeweler and had it inscribed in the following engraving, to Edwin Booth from Mark Gray Lyon. He wore it around his neck for many years to come. The second McVickers Theater is where the first talking motion picture to play in Chicago, Lights of New York had its premiere on August 3rd, 1928. By 1979, the third McVickers Theater at this location had fallen on hard times. By this time, it was reduced to showing X-rated adult movies in a vermin infested auditorium. It fell to the Wreckers Ball in 1984 and the memories of the many famous players of stage and, uh, and screen who graced it forever faded. Uh, the first talking motion picture uh, was uh, premiered uh, at the McVickers Theater uh, in 1928. Um, it was uh, the venue uh, for three performance, three separate performances by John Wilkes Booth uh, between 1862 and 1864. Uh, he had wandered across the South. He, uh, he fell in love with Southern culture there are a number of biographies about Booth. Uh, it really explains his mindset. Uh, and he believed that uh, Lincoln was responsible for the downfall of Southern culture and a Southern way of life and became a fanatic and abandoned his acting career. He had failed in numerous business ventures, including an oil uh, business, an oil rig that he uh, put money into. And uh, by April 14th, 1865, uh, it was kind of written in the wind about what was to happen. Next. Meet Peter Shuttler. This is a great haunted house story. My book could not have been complete without a chilling ghost story. I discovered the legend of Peter Shuttler in his mansion on West Adams Street near Aberdeen and was reminded of Shirley Jackson famous novel, The Haunting of Hill House. I'm sure many of you might have seen the famous 1963 movie. Uh, this is Peter Shuttler, a Chicago pioneer. Uh, this is actually Peter Shuttler II. Uh, could not find a photo of his father. But Peter II inherited this Victorian mansion from his father, uh, a wealthy and powerful business tycoon known as the Wagon King of Chicago. He manufactured thousands of covered wagons bound for the Western frontier in California. You see here on the left, the company's best-selling product, a farm wagon called the Old Reliable. That was in fact, the first Model T, if you will, of the horse-drawn variety. Uh, the founder, Peter Shuttler I, opened his small wagon manufacturing business at Randolph and Franklin in the 18. 40s, not long after he had emigrated from Ohio. Uh, during the Mormon exodus of uh, 1846, 47, and 48, Peter Shuttler I made his fortune selling covered wagons uh, that would transport them uh, out to the state of Utah. And in fact, many Western settlers heading west from St. Joseph, Missouri, purchased Shuttler wagons uh, during this period, and it made uh, the family overnight millionaires. And then during the Civil War, he was manufacturing caissons uh, uh, for the Union Army. Next. In 1863, uh, Peter Shuttler I built this luxurious mansion designed in the Louis XVI style by famed Chicago architect John Van Osdell who really was Chicago's signature architecture uh, in the antebellum period and was responsible for so many of our original structures. European artisans crossed the ocean to hand paint the walls and plant a lush garden with a greenhouse as the Civil War raged. Sparing no cost, the final bill came out to $500,000. That's the equivalent of 9 million today. Next. This is a photograph of the house in its later years. The builder 
Peter Shuttler I, did not live long enough to enjoy his place. He suffered blood poisoning and died in December of 1864. Following his death, the agoraphobic widow, Dorothy, was adjudged insane and confined into the widow's peak, the room at the top of the tower that you see there. Soon, rumors circulated that Dorothy had committed suicide inside her sick room, but Peter II, her son, hotly denied the accusation. Quote, immediately upon her death, the apparitions, it is said, began to appear in the tower room, wrote Chicago Inter-Ocean reporter Mary Doherty in 1913. Peter closed the house and moved to the north side as tenement housing and factory buildings replaced the vanishing Adams Street mansions. Um, before the Civil War, Adams Street uh, was considered the west side of Chicago, and it was lined from east to west with very elegant uh, uh, mansions. But gradually, once they put in the streetcars uh, around 1872, 73, it began bringing in uh, uh, different classes of people, and it chased away all these moneyed people, and their houses began to be subdivided uh, if they weren't outright torn down uh, and replaced with factory buildings and or more utilitarian kinds of housing, became tenements and it quickly declined. But back to the hauntings. Uh, Ms. Doherty, the reporter wrote, quote, many old settlers and not a few of the, of the last generation will readily assure you that often at night they have watched the phantom split to and fro past the long French windows and down the marble stairway, which can be seen through the side windows disappearing at daybreak. The old mansion passed into the hands of a boarding house keeper who rented it to transients by the week, and then later as a livery stable, where in the elegant ballroom, uh, hay was spread across the floor and horses were stabled inside what had once been a beautiful ballroom with hand-painted images on the ceiling and terracotta and you name it. Uh, it had a rather ignoble ending, won't you say? In the coming years, four of the Shuttler heirs suffered tragic outcomes and died in the prime of life. The last one in Skokie in 1952, a suicide. One of them jumped through the window of the Chicago Athletic Club downtown. Another one was uh, hanged himself in a bathroom. So you want, it raises the question about hauntings and curses. They, they seem interchangeable. Though long forgotten, the Shuttler haunting was retold on many a Halloween night up until the 1950s when it drifted into the realm of forgotten news. Next. Ah, uh, the stockyards. Certainly not forgotten. Um, but we may be forgiven in any rate for the terrible stench uh, and the inconvenience we caused to tourists who had to endure the smells for 106 years. In those 106 years spanning 1865 to 1971, the Union Stockyards in the words of Chicago Tribune writer was the eighth wonder of the world, quote, with sufficient meats packed here to feed the world, end quote. Those of you, and I don't know if anybody here, is anybody of South Cider by any chance originally? Ah, one person, there you go. And you might have remembered uh, those South Side evenings, especially during the summer and the stench wafting through the air in the hot summer months before air conditioning. Um, I always said that um, kids uh, didn't go to sleep counting sheep, they counted the cows uh, in their dreams. The great meat packing houses adjoining the stockyards became the largest single employer and the city's number one tourist destination. In 1894, after touring the Union stockyards, the French novelist Paul Bourget remarked, quote, a pig that went to the abattoir, and that's another word for slaughterhouse, at Chicago, came out 15 minutes later in the form of ham, sausages, hair oil, large and small hair, glue, gelatin, 
insulin, fertilizer, pepsin, canned fruit, cosmetics, margarine, sausage casing, hairbrushes, and binding for Bibles. <laughs> All those products derive from animal carcasses. Next. Barely 30 years of age, this man, John Sherman, a former gold prospector, hired 1,000 Union Army veterans to build the livestock pens and trenches in, in 1865. You want me to? Uh... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Union Stockyards and Transit Company opened for business the day after Christmas in 1865 on the former marshland at 41st Street and Halstead. Henry Ford borrowed the assembly line concept for his Detroit automobile factories after observing the efficient and rapid meatpacking operations. On December 15, 1924, the packing houses set an all-time record for livestock receipts in a single day, processing 10,673 calves, 4,928 head of cattle, 71,792 sheep, and 122,000 hogs. It must have been a busy day. This is the disease-ridden, muck-filled Bubbly Creek in the south branch of the Chicago River. You would not want to swim in it or drink from it. For decades, the meatpacking plants dumped animal carcasses and industrial waste from the sewage outlets clogging and poisoning the river and wildlife. Murderers, armed robbers, and other criminal thugs frequently tossed their victims from atop the Ashland Avenue bridge into the sludge. And I found out that this is actually true. It's not a made up story. In 1911, a man was walking across the bridge on Ashland Avenue near 39th Street. Uh, he was clouded over the head with a stick, robbed, and tossed into the drink. He was unconscious, but he didn't sink. He lay on that layer of ooze all night long, didn't sink because that's how thick the sludge was. And when he woke up in the morning, he made his way to the shoreline, staggered home with about 105 fever and died later that night. But uh, that kind of alerted the authorities that it was time to do something about this mess. Here's a more pastoral image of Bubbly Creek and what it looks like today. Over the years, the Chicago Sanitary District and the EPA closed off sections of the creek and did a good job of cleanup. But even today, especially in summer, one can still see the bubbles of methane gas coming up to the surface of the water at 39th and Ashland. Um, I, I, former years, I was doing bus tours for the Chicago History Museum, famous crime scenes in Chicago. And I took uh, one of my South Side tours, I took the bus down there. We went right to the edge of the river. Uh, it was an August day. And I said, see if any of you can see the bubbles coming up. And indeed, the bubbles were present, although small, that the, that the mess, despite all of the multiple cleanups, it was still this, these carcasses from the early 20th century that were still causing it. It's absolutely incredible. Okay. The old stockyards closed in 1971 as meat processing uh, became more centrally located with no further need to ship off the animals by rail to Chicago. Today, all that remains is a bust of John Sherman's prize bull, which, he, which was named Sherman, and it's embedded in the ceremonial arch that stands at Exchange Avenue west of uh, Halstead. And there you see a then and now photo of it. It was designed as a tribute to Sherman by the esteemed architect Daniel Burnham, whose wife happened to be Sherman's daughter, Margaret. Um, the cattle would go to, and Stan could probably talk about this much better than I, to the cow towns of Abilene, Hayes, Kansas, and Dodge City, and thus the legend of, of, the, of the West through all the famous Westerns like Rawhide that we used to see, tells that story and how the cow towns became wild. And ultimately the final destination point 
from those old fashioned Western cow towns were the Chicago Union stockyards. This is the Grand Pacific Hotel. In this vintage Chicago hotel, the Grand Pacific, is where I like to say modern time began. Grand, uh, the Grand Pacific stood at the corner of Jackson Boulevard and LaSalle Street. Presently, the Bank of America building occupies that location. Opened just after the Chicago fire, this spacious and very uh, luxurious hotel was eventually demolished in two phases. The first half of it in 1895, and the rest of the building came down in 1919. But before 1883, there were 8,000 functioning time zones crisscrossing the United States. There was no Central, Pacific, Eastern, or Mountain time zones as we know today. The nation and the world kept time by looking at the clock in the town square through a hand, or through a handy pocket watch, or by reading the published railroad schedules like this next image. This is a typical 19th century train schedule. Confusing and maddening to read, the train schedules were based on dozens of local time zones. For example, crossing the country via rail from New York to Los Angeles required passengers to reset their watches a minimum of 20 times before reaching the West Coast. Each town decided pretty much based on what the railroad demanded, what time of day it would be. And it would vary from anywhere from five to 10 minutes to 20 minutes. But all of that would change inside the luxurious Grand Pacific where modern time was born during a plenary session of the general time convention held in the ballroom uh, between October 11th and the 13th of 1883. Inside the hotel, Charles Ferdinand Dowd introduced his plan for standard time, comprising four United States time zones and covering the maritime provinces of Canada. His plan was adopted, and before the year was out, the simplified plan was put into practice. But in a very strange twist of irony, uh, uh, Mr. Dowd perished in a, freak, in a freakish railroad accident underneath the wheels of a train in Saratoga Springs, New York, on November 12, 1904. Age 79 at the time, he might have escaped if only his pocket watch had been in error. He might have missed the train and escaped death. As you uh, walk eastbound on Jackson Boulevard by LaSalle on the Bank of America building, there's a little plaque uh, that, uh, that was placed there to commemorate the time convention. People walk by it every day without giving it a second thought. You know where it is, right, Stan? And, uh, but sometimes stop and look at some of these plaques <laughs> because as historical markers, they tell an interesting story. Um, I would not have known about this until I stopped there to read the plaque and then I did some research as to what it was all about. In 1886, Montgomery Ward acquired from the U.S. Warehouse and Manufacturing Company valuable property fronting Lakefront Park, which we now know as Grant Park. From the northwest corner of Michigan and Madison, Aaron Montgomery Ward, the catalog prince, gave to his employees a location where they could enjoy sunlight and a relatively quiet location to work and enjoy a scenic view of the lake in its frontal property. Mr. Ward was passionate about preserving the lakefront park from buildings and other obstructions to impair that view. His advocacy became known in legal statutes at the time as the free and clear doctrine. This is a uh, Montgomery Ward catalog. Uh, he started out in the catalog business. He, it was not Richard Sears or Alva Roebuck who started it. They copied Montgomery Ward uh, in the, with the idea of merchandising from a single location and relying on the various postal expresses in the US post office to deliver goods. The 
The first challenge to Ward's free and clear doctrine came in June of 1864, when the city granted permission to the Democratic Party to build a convention hall at the southern end of the park at 11th Street. This is the wigwam, as it was called. And this is where the Democrats would nominate General George McClellan to run against President Lincoln after the courts lifted a temporary injunction to halt construction of this building. The Democrats agreed with the proviso that the wigwam would be demolished six days after the convention. And indeed it was. They would use names like wigwam alternately for temporary structures. The first wigwam in 1860, which stood on Lake Street, uh, was where Abraham Lincoln was nominated. And there, there are two plaques uh, at that location. Next, the Chicago White Stockings baseball team. They were the forerunners of the Cubs. The Cubs were once called the White Stockings in the 19th century. Uh, built this enclosure at Michigan Avenue in Randolph during the 1871 season. This wooden ballpark was the Union baseball grounds and it stood opposite of where the Prudential Building is today. The Chicago fire destroyed the park that same year, but just seven years later, the White Stockings returned to play their home games in the new wooden grandstand that you see here. Montgomery Ward took the matter to the courts and succeeded in forcing the team to relocate to the west side following the 1884 season. And there they would remain uh, until uh, 1916. The Interstate Industrial Building uh, was Chicago's first convention hall of any consequence. It was built in 1873. It hosted four presidential nominating conventions until it was torn down and replaced by the Art Institute. Although Ward opposed both buildings, the courts granted an exception to the free and clear doctrine for both properties in the name of cultural enrichment. This was also called the glass palace because there was so much glass work and it leaked. Can you imagine uh, rain falling inside uh, through the many cracks and fissures in that glass? It was one reason that doomed this building to obsolescence. After the Chicago fire and for years afterward, squatter shacks like these and temporary buildings, including a post office, traveling circus tents, were all erected on Lakefront Park. But in time, they were all to come down. Uh, look at that. There's no grass you see there. A lot of the debris from the Chicago fire was filled in some of that marshland, and it extended uh, the length of the beach uh, to Michigan Avenue. So. I'm assuming that this photo was probably taken sometime in the 1880s or 1890s. Architect Richard Schmidt built the Montgomery Ward headquarters building in 1899. At the time, it was the tallest structure in Chicago, standing 394 feet high. The Ward building still stands, but the pyramid top uh, and the statue of Diana were later removed. So that cupola at the top is gone, uh, but the building uh, chopped off uh, still remains. Lakefront Park, uh, looking south. This is a view that Ward observed from his office window around that same time. Kind of a pastoral setting, the modern city of Chicago is taking shape here. This is a northerly view uh, from 12th Street, then called Park Place, and the Illinois Central Depot. Through the 1960s, passenger and freight trains continued to traverse the path to the depots north of Hubbard Street, just north of the Chicago River. Uh, the new east side that has developed uh, with the towers Vista and Aqua that you might be familiar with, those are the developments of Joel Carlins, uh, who is a um, developer, real estate developer. I know him. Um, we were at one time, we're talking about doing a book together, but he literally is the unofficial mayor of Chicago's new east side because that forest of skyscrapers that stand uh, there stand in, on old railroad land, which was contaminated. And they had to do a complete EPA cleanup of that site before uh, all of those famous new buildings that you see went up. 
Illinois Supreme Court Justice James Cartwright decided two of the three important cases in favor of Ward and the Free and Clear Doctrine over a 15 year span leading up to 1902. They were Bliss versus Ward, Ward versus the Field Museum, and Ward versus the South Park Commissioners. Old Aaron was quite a determined man to keep his park clear. With the rendering of the final verdict in 1902, Ward celebrated his victory by saying, quote, I fought for the poor people of Chicago, not for the millionaires. Millennium Park. It opened July 16, 2004, spanning 24 and a half acres of Grant Park. 25 million people visit it annually. It is considered the most important civic project since the World's Fair of 1893. And tucked away in the recesses of the park is a portrait bust of Aaron Montgomery Ward in the Ward Gardens along the edge of Grant Park between Randolph and Monroe. What we got here? Enter a new screen name. We'll cancel that. There we go. <laughs> The marker was moved to the southwest side of Grant Park in 1999 and rededicated in 2005 with the opening of Millennium Park. There has been no other public tribute or official recognition given to this intensely private man or his crusade as the savior of the lakefront. The inscription reads in part, Grant Park is his legacy to the city he loved, his gift to the future. War destroyed all of his business correspondence and his private papers because uh, he did not want to see biographies written about him in the future. And uh, he is an extremely difficult public man to do research on because there's simply nothing much left other than newspaper clips that one finds. Elisha Gray, a forgotten hero. He was a superintendent of the Western Electric Company and the forgotten scientist and inventor who gave us the telephone. I submit that it was Mr. Gray of Highland Park and not Alexander Graham Bell who deserves the rightful credit for the invention that changed the world. On January 5th, 1876, inside an office in the old union building at the corner of Washington and LaSalle, Gray demonstrated his remarkable device for the first time following several years of trial and error inside his laboratory in Highland Park. A mile distant on Kinsey Street, the transmitting operator controlling the sound producing mechanism provided a musical accompaniment, playing on his violin several popular tunes of the day, including Robin Adair, Coming Through the Rye, and Old Lang Syne. It marked the first time sound in music was transmitted over an electric wire in Chicago. Elisha Gray, a Scots-Irish Quaker, manned his 16 inch sounding board with an electric magnet placed on top of the surface. As the music piped in, astonished visitors called it the miracle of the age. And here you see a diagram of it, the first telephone. Mr. Gray obtained a patent for a successful invention, making it possible to transmit musical values which he called electroharmonic telegraphy on July 27, 1875. With working capital of $2,000 in 1889, he organized a company called Gray and Barton, manufacturer, seller, and dealer of burglary alarms, telegraphy equipment, and electrical supplies. In 1872, this company's name was changed, and you might know, be more familiar with Western Electric. That was the company that he founded which was headquartered for many years in the town of Cicero. Meanwhile, Elisha Gray struggled, struggled to transmit the spoken word, not just music, over the wire. One day he observed his nephew playing with coils and wires attached to a zinc-lined bathtub in the house. Now that sounds kind of dangerous, doesn't it? But Gray was struck by a sudden inspiration. Electric harmonic telegraphy, the transmission of sound through wire. And he said, my nephew was playing with a small induction coil, taking shocks for the amusement of the younger children. 
good God, man, where were your senses? I mean, Gray later recalled, quote, he had connected one end of the secondary coil to the zinc lining of the bathtub tub when it was dry, end quote. In the race to become the official inventor of the telephone and secure the necessary patent, Gray continued his experiments in 1876 until the time came to file the application in the U.S. Patent Office in Washington. On February 14th of that year, uh, he paid $10 and submitted his application and expected to receive it. His principal rival, Alexander Graham Bell of Brantford, Ontario, allegedly filed through his lawyer a few hours earlier. However, Mr. Bell was in Boston on the 14th of that month and did not arrive in Washington until February 26. Based on the original time stamp and the verification of the attorney's credentials, the examiners granted Bell two letters of patent. Embittered, Gray engaged in a long and costly legal battle asserting that it was he and not Bell <coughs> who deserved the patent and all of the credit and of course, all the money that would go with it. Gray had filed an affidavit with one Zenus Fisk Wilbur, that was his name. He was the principal examiner in charge of electrical invention patents in 1875 through 1877. As it turned out, Wilbur had been bribed by agents representing Bell who was personally indebted to one of Bell's attorneys. So this was bribery. Wilbur owed money to an attorney. Thus, history records Bell and not Gray as the telephone inventor. It seems clear that fraud and deceit had a lot to do with the final decision. Kind of sounds like Chicago, doesn't it? But again, it's a Chicago connection, so what do you expect, right? In 1887, justices of the Morrison Waite Supreme Court came within one vote of overturning the Bell patent. Just one vote changed the course of history. Mr. Gray died on January 1st, 1901, in Newtonville, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. He said in his notes, the history of the telephone will never be written. It is partly hidden away in 20 or 30,000 pages of testimony and partly lying in the hearts and conscience of a few whose lips are sealed, end quote. How many of you like to go to races? A couple people. Well, this was the first automobile race in the country and it took place in Chicago. In the evolution of the automobile, Chicago played an important but hidden role. We hosted the first road race in November of 1895, the day after a Thanksgiving Day blizzard. The fierce snowstorm dumped a foot of snow on Chicago streets the night before the race, forcing the sponsor, the Chicago Times Herald newspaper, to scale back the race course. The contest featured six fearless drivers from around the country vying for a gold medal and a $5,000 cash prize from the publisher of uh, Herman Colsat, who published the Chicago Times Herald. Automobile, a word unfamiliar to most people in the early 1890s, had not yet entered the American vocabulary. Horseless carriage, the most obvious choice one would think, didn't seem to hold any appeal for the drivers. The editors of the paper and the judges agreed on a rather curious name. The moto cycle, not motorcycle, but moto cycle. That's the first automobile, the moto cycle. Those early automobiles were essentially little more than a buckboard mounted with an engine, kind of like putting a, um, a lawnmower motor on a, on a wagon, I would think. The six fearless drivers who set out that day on a 54 mile slog originating at the Museum of Science and Industry and traveling north to Evanston and back again, encountered slick, unpaved, uh, snow-covered roads and drove at an impressive average speed of seven miles per hour. <laughs> the event concluded 10 hours and 15 minutes later after the eventual winner, Peoria natives Charles and Frank Durier, shown here, crossed the finish line 
long after the judges had gone home. The other drivers had either gotten lost in the tangle of city streets and arrived late or overturned their unsteady machines in the winter snow drifts and slush. By 10 o'clock that night, the last straggler, the R.H. Macy carriage of the Macy department store, made it back safely, but with a broken steering gear. Science Magazine uh, said that, quote, when the newspaper announced the race and offered a cash prize, there were only three self-driven road vehicles in the United States. But by November 2nd, 1895, there were 75. We also had a racetrack. Uh, the village of Forest Park, um, as Anne may well know, was once, uh, was once called Harlem, the village of Harlem. And it had a racetrack. In 1901, the Chicago Automobile Club sponsored a day-long competition inviting daredevil drivers to the old Harlem racetrack at 12th Street and Harlem Avenue in now uh, Forest Park to compete for prizes and notoriety. The track was closed permanently in 1905 because promoters decided that automobile racing was too dangerous of a sport and had no future. Alternately, it was a thoroughbred racetrack but they didn't like people betting on horses in Illinois. So for a period of 15 years, they made betting illegal and the horse races stopped until 1922 when they were allowed in again. That was an early form of prohibition, only it wasn't with alcohol. But meanwhile, in North uh, suburban Glencoe, the first speed bumps were placed at strategic locations along Sheridan Road and Green Bay Road to deter daredevil motorists from what they used to call scorching. That's the word most often applied to speed demon bicyclists of that era, unmindful of pedestrian safety through quiet residential neighborhoods. I think we can sometimes say the same thing here in Norwood Park when we hear cars racing around at two o'clock in the morning. In 1901, New York became the first state to license automobiles. Six years later, Sidney Gorham, an attorney with the Chicago Motor Club, and the author of the state's original licensing bill acquired Illinois plate number one. He held on to it until his death in 1938 when it was reissued to George Cardinal Mundelein. A little bit more about him later. How many of you are familiar with the story of the, of the Christmas uh, ship? Several of you. It's a very heartwarming tale. With a crew of 16, Captain Herman Schooneman, and he's shown in the middle of this photo, uh, commanded the Rouse Simmons, a 125-foot, three-masted schooner traversing Lake Michigan to the upper peninsula of Michigan. The Simmons departed Thompson's Pier in Manistique, bound for Chicago, on November 21st, 1912, with a load of freshly cut uh, Christmas trees under overcast skies. This became an annual holiday tradition. Uh, the Schooneman family would dispatch a schooner to cut down the trees and bring them back to Chicago and sell them on the, uh, on the Chicago River for 25 cents a tree uh, and, the, and maybe five cents for a wreath. And it became a very time-honored and wonderful old tradition that went on for a number of years. Unwilling to allow his vessel uh, to sit idle in port for five months between November and April, Herman and his brothers made the decision, therefore, to brighten the Yuletide for Chicagoans. The family sold their trees to the general public at that location on Clark Street for many, many years. This was the age of sale, and the Schoonemans were rugged men of the Great Lakes, unafraid of fearsome winter squalls that had sent an estimated 2,000 vessels and their cargo to the bottom of Lake Michigan. The heavily loaded Simmons sailed into the choppy waters through the uh, toward a tragic destiny. Blowing snow obscured the captain's vision as the winds howled. The onboard flares and distress signals were useless in the winter squall, but after seven days with no sign of the Simmons, a Coast Guard spotter in Kewanee, Wisconsin, reported seeing a three-mast schooner flying its signals. As the vessel made its way south toward Chicago, the storm worsened as ice cover and ice covered the decks and its cargo of trees. Violent winds tore apart the sails and the squall line of snow 
blinded rescuers from the nearby Tuscarora. The Ralph Simmons was re, uh, resigned to the inevitable fate, becoming the Flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes. All was lost. 16 crew members and one woman went down with the Simmons. On the one year anniversary of the sinking, L.C. Schooneman presented a written memorial to the Chicago Tribune Advertising Department announcing her mother's intention to honor her husband's memory by keeping alive the tradition. Quote, our husband and father spent his life in doing what he could to further the happiness of others, end quote. In, in reference, we pay tribute to his memory and to the brave men who met death with him. We are taking up our father's work just where he left off. There will be another Christmas tree ship in Chicago this year. Mother is now up in Northern Michigan, superintending the cutting of the trees. Here we see Hazel and Pearl Schooneman selling their handmade Christmas wreaths from the deck of the, of the schooner, which they fashioned from the Hall of Michigan first. The wonderful old tradition ended in 1944. <laughs> the railroads and trucking companies delivered abundant supplies of trees into the city, but the legend of the Rouse Simmons lived on. And in the poetry of Vincent Sterrett, who was a very famous Chicago Daily News reporter, uh, he composed this little verse. This is the tale of the Christmas ship that sailed o'er the sullen lake and the 16 souls that made the trip and of death in the foaming wake. It's baseball season and this Sox fan is gonna tell you a little bit about the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> Forgotten in the saga of the Chicago Cubs, and their 2016 World Series championship is the man who built Wrigley Field. Charles Henry Wiegman, shown on the right in this image, was a man of heart and humor, an enterprising and persevering spirit born in the age of Horatio Alger optimism. Charlie, he was called Lucky Charlie for a time, was a sportsman, nightclub promoter, theater owner, baseball promoter, and the uncredited inventor of the fast food restaurant, all in one life. Wiegman, the son of a Richmond, Indiana blacksmith, arrived in Chicago to attend the 1893 World's Fair. Within 20 years, he owned a string of downtown cafeterias designed to accommodate dinners quickly and move them in and out with a menu of food items that never changed. His wealth and influence growing Wiegman turned to the sports world, but failed in his attempt to purchase the St. Louis Cardinals in 1911. In 1914, James Gilmore, president of the Federal League, which was a new baseball association challenging the monopoly of the National and American Leagues, invited Wiegman and wholesale fish dealer William Walker. Here's a, by the way, here's a shot of Wrigley Field under construction. Wiegman Park, as it was called, under construction. Um, Wrigley Field uh, was designed by, I, I call it Wrigley Field, but really it was Wiegman Park, it was designed by architect Zachary Taylor Davis, who designed Comiskey Park four years earlier. And uh, the name of the team that was to play in this ballpark, they were called the Chicago Whales of the new Federal League. Ground broke on March the 4th, 1914. And a month later, less than a month later after groundbreaking, on April 23rd, in record time, the future home of the Cubs opened its doors as Wiegman Park. The final cost, which were paid for completely by Charlie Wiegman, came in at $250,000. Now imagine today a baseball stadium would be about $82 million. Uh, on opening day for the Chicago Whales versus the Kansas City Packers, uh, Chicago Mayor William Hale Thompson, a very colorful figure in his own right, and our last Republican mayor threw out the first pitch on opening day. And here you see him. Here is the team's original 1914 Shy Fed logo on a souvenir pennant. In 1914, they were called the Shy Feds, Chicago Federals. Uh, <coughs> Wiegman decided to have a more colorful name and he uh, invited through a newspaper contest fans to submit a new name for the team. The name Wales was chosen because, quote, the biggest commercial whales live on the north side. 
which is a little bit of braggadocio that wasn't quite on the mark because the north side was the newest side of Chicago to fill in, so it wasn't quite as prominent in 1914-15 as it is today. But beset by financial problems and the failure to win an antitrust lawsuit against uh, the American and National Leagues, the feds were forced to fold their league after just two seasons. As part of the final settlement, Charlie Wiegman and several other owners were permitted to buy into two established leagues. Lucky Charlie paid $500,000 to Charles P. Taft of Cincinnati, the brother of the former president of the United States and the owner of the Chicago Cubs. Minutes before Wiegman's option to buy the Cubs had expired, he presented his check to the cashier at the Corn Exchange Bank on January 20th, 1916. William Wrigley, owner of a chewing gum and confectionery business, became Wiegman's minority partner. Meanwhile, uh, Wiegman moved the Cubs from that west side ballpark that I told you about earlier into his new stadium at Clark and Addison. He would own the Cubs only for three seasons, including their 1918 World Series championship year. Backed into a difficult financial position, his restaurants failing and on the brink of receivership, Wiegman sold the Cubs to Wrigley on December 7, 1918. In 1920, his restaurants were thrown into a receivership. Charlie's wife sued him for divorce on the grounds of adultery. William Wrigley purchased Wiegman Park for $295,000 in 1924, and that was two years before he named it Wrigley Field, and the rest, as they say, is history. Charlie Wiegman passed away inside the Drake Hotel in 1938 and became the forgotten man of Chicago baseball and also forgotten by the Cubs. I do think that among the statues outside of Wrigley Field, they should build one to Charlie Wiegman. And I've encouraged some of my Cub fan friends to start a petition. Um, although they did bring Wiegman's sur only surviving relative, a great grandniece, to throw out the uh, first pitch in 2016 on the 100th anniversary, uh, which I thought was a nice gesture. But in Cub uh, literature and in books, you don't see a whole lot about Wiegman. Um, I kind of think the Cubs think of him as something of an embarrassment, but they wouldn't be where they are today without him. This is the poisoning case. Gene Crohn's. Uh, this would have been mass murder on an amazing horrifying basis had it uh, succeeded. The elevation of Archbishop Supich to the College of Cardinals in 2016 brings to mind this near tragic episode in the life of Chicago's much revered George Cardinal Mundelein in an attempted mass murder. It happened at the University Club on the evening of February 10th, 1916, when 200 of Chicago's most prominent citizens gathered for a testimonial dinner, welcoming Mundelein to the city. Invitees included seven archbishops, noted surgeons, two former Illinois governors, Mayor Carter Harrison and future Mayor William Emmett Dever, Arthur Meeker, an author and stockyards magnate, and Samuel Insull of Commonwealth Edison. They were there as this, in this lavish dinner to welcome Mundelein. Gene Crohn's, the man in the chef's hat, he was the Belgian chef working in the kitchen, and he had immigrated from the U.S. from Cologne, Germany in 1913. He was hired as the new assistant chef by the manager of the university club. Remembered as a reserve man with few friends, Crohn's was an avowed anarchist opposed to civil authority organized religion, and the rule of government. He had devised a fiendish plot to poison Mundelein and all of the banquet guests in the room that night. He did it by spiking the consomme soup with 480 grains of arsenic injected into tiny meatballs in the chicken broth. Within minutes, nearly all who had sampled the broth stumbled from their chairs and fell to the floor violently ill. Chaos erupted in the dining room. Miraculously, the soup had been watered down at the last minute by a kitchen employee 
who was concerned that the stock appeared to be spoiled. Dr. John B. Murphy, a banquet uh, attendee, administered a mixture of mustard and water and served it as an anemic to the stricken. The story was front page news from coast to coast. While nearly everyone, except Mundelein, who said he was on a diet, took sick, no one perished that evening. Although in the next six months, several elderly men suffering gastro complications from the ordeal passed away. And here you see uh, police in the newspapers hot on a trail. Um, questioned by reporters later, Archbishop Mundelein quipped, and I quote, you know, it takes something stronger than soup to get to me, he said. <laughs> The detective squad imposed a citywide dragnet, but efforts to seize Crohn's failed. He eluded capture and fled Chicago. He remained a fugitive of justice as police scoured the nation's known anarchist haunts in many different cities. They followed up on, this, on dozens of unconfirmed reports of, the, of his presence in the Portsmouth, Virginia Naval Yards up through New England. On March 24th, 1924, Mundelein became the first cardinal to serve the Catholic Church west of the Alleghenies. He led the archdiocese until his passing in 1939 and was honored by the village trustees of Mechanics Grove, 35, 35 miles northwest of Chicago in April 1925 by renaming the community Mundelein, which we know now. Crohn's died in the house that he lived in Nobody thought to even check his home residence, and he was never arrested, never served time, and died very peacefully. You can't make this stuff up, you know? You really can't. How many of you have seen Love Me or Leave Me? It's a great old, great old movie. Um, it starred Doris Day as 1920s torch singer Ruth Edding. And Jimmy Cagney is her gangster husband, Mo the Gimp Snyder. The movie earned six Academy Award nominations, including one for Cagney as Best Actor. The real life, Edding and Snyder, uh, coming from opposite worlds, is memorable. Early in life, Martin Snyder, a tough talking, wise guy from Chicago's West Side Valley District along Ogden Avenue, mangled his left leg in a streetcar mishap that left him with a permanent limp and a cruel nickname. They tagged him as Mo the Gimp. Snyder was a Damon Runyon-esque character, uh, a fast-talking promoter for Chicago recording studios and the publishers of sheet music. He prowled the hotel bars and gained backstage admittance to Chicago's vaudeville houses, show lounges and ballrooms, where he cozied up to the big stars of the day and got to know their managers. At the peak of her fame, Ruth Edding's admiring fans knew her as Chicago's sweetheart. While she might have belonged to the Windy City in the heyday of early radio and vaudeville, her fame was national. Edding worked a part-time job earning $25 a week in the chorus line at the Marigold Gardens at Grayson Broadway. And here you see it, it's long gone for a lot of, in the past 20 or 25 years, it was an IHOP at Grayson Broadway. And now that was torn down They're building, there's a new building that's just opened. I'm not sure what purpose it serves, but uh, the Miracle Gardens was a vaudeville nightclub. And then later it became a boxing gymnasium where many of Chicago's uh, uh, local boxers uh, earned some degree of fame uh, there. But before the year had ended in 1921, the year that Snyder discovered her in the chorus line, uh, he had divorced his first wife and abandoned his daughter, Edith, in order to run off to Crown Point, Indiana. That's where all the quickie marriages took place in those days. <clears throat> After bullying Ruth into agreeing to a marriage, Snyder took over every aspect of her life. He lived off of her earnings and intimidated night cl nightclub owners to book her for extended engagements. On the nights when the audience was thin and the room nearly empty, Snyder stood outside the nightclub and paid passers-by to go in and watch the show with the promise that they would applaud enthusiastically after every song. 
As her fame grew, Mo lived off of her earnings, blowing Ruth's money at crap tables and card games in Chicago, New York City, and Hollywood hotel rooms without apology or regret. All through our married life, he never paid one cent of rent, Ruth told reporters. He never worked and he always interfered with my career. And his abuse began right after our marriage. Everyone knew about it and talked about it. This fell down, but I don't think I, I think you can all hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Everyone knew and talked about it, but I decided I'd have to go ahead despite his surly manner and rough ways, end quote. Here's Ruth bound for Europe to give her first uh, set of concerts overseas. She attained stardom in 1925 when Ziegfeld Follies brought her to New York to kick off her career. She became a radio star with such hits as Love Me or Leave Me, It Happened in Monterey, Thinking of You, and No, No, Nora. Rather upbeat woman despite an unhappy marital life, wouldn't you say? As sales of her sheet music soared, on November 15th, 1937, Edding announced her plan for an uncontested divorce from Snyder on the grounds of mental cruelty and desertion. In the final divorce settlement, she gave Snyder $50,000 in cash to pay off his gambling debts and half interest in their Beverly Hills home. Edding began a romance with 30-year-old Merle Alderman, her piano accompanist, song arranger, and boyfriend. He was a married man 13 years younger than her. And when the story broke, Alderman's estranged wife filed an alienation of affection lawsuit against Ruth. Hearing this news sparked wild rage in Snyder, who rushed to Los Angeles to confront Alderman. In the early evening hours of October 15, 1938, Snyder forced Alderman at the point of a gun to accompany him to Edding's home on Lake Hollywood Drive to settle this old score. In the presence of his daughter and Ruthie, Snyder shot Alderman in the stomach. Merle Alderman, though, was fortunate to survive. Here we see uh, some of the sensational headlines. <clears throat> Snyder was eventually found guilty of attempted murder. He won a new trial on a technicality on July 24th, 1940, but by now, Merle and Ruthie were married and had moved on with their lives. They declined to appear as prosecution witnesses in the second trial, resulting in Mo Snyder's release by the Los Angeles District Attorney. Snyder came away from this a broken man. From time to time, he was seen spotting, he was spotted selling newspapers at Frankie Pope's newsstand just outside City Hall at Clark and Randolph. Uh, Frankie Pope was uh, called the millionaire newsboy. He was an associate of the Al Capone mob, and uh, uh, he owned all the, the string of newsstands, hence being a millionaire newsboy. This once dapper figure of the nightlife, uh, Mo Snyder, uh, lived as a down and outer in the old city, city Hall Square Hotel and worked for a time in the City Water Pipe Extension Bureau. It's kind of an irony because uh, I'm just leaving my job now in the water billing department of City Hall, but I don't find any trace of Mo Snyder where I work. Snyder lived out the remainder of his days in Chicago and died at the ripe old age of 87 on November 9th, 1981. Edding made a brief comeback in March 1947 after signing on for a three-week singing engagement at the Copacabana in New York. <laughs> she passed away on September 24th, 1978 in Colorado Springs. Her marriage to Alderman lasted 28 years. Even though she was 10 years older than him, she outlived him by 12 years. I actually uh, talked to Ruth Edding in 1977. I had a, my first writing job was with the Learner Newspapers, and uh, there was an old vaudevillian by the name of Rudy Horn, who I was doing a story on. And at Rudy's apartment, uh, he called Ruth Edding, who was living out west, and the, there was a three-way conversation. And at that time, I didn't know who Ruth Edding was. And then I saw the movie, and uh, she was a delightful lady and uh, had a rough life, but uh, died quite happily. 
We've had two magnificent world's fairs in 1893 and 1933, and the lesser known railroad fairs of 1948 and 49. This fair celebrated the 100th anniversary of the first railroad constructed in Chicago, uh, the Pioneer completing its first run on October 10th, 1848. It was cause for a celebration. And along the lakefront where the Century of Progress World's Fair was held previously, uh, they opened up the lakefront to what they called wheels of rolling. Did you go, Stan, were you there? Yeah, 49. Yep. The World's Fair of Railroading uh, was held between 12th Street south to 31st Street with the, with the star attraction, the Wheels of Rolling pageant, silhouetted against Lake Michigan shoreline, and it inspired Walt Disney to create Disneyland, uh, featuring a frontier land and a Tomorrowland. Walt Disney had just visited Dearborn Village in Michigan, and on his way back to California, he stopped at the uh, Wheels of Rolling, and that gave him the idea to start Disneyland. The 1948 fair was a great success and it was decided to host another one in 1949. The relentless expansion of the commercial airline industry, however, and the construction of the interstate highway system in the 1950s and 60s closed out a mode of transportation many people still cherish. By 1971, nearly all of Chicago's ornate and glamorous old train stations fell to the wrecking ball and the legendary trains with names like the 20th Century Limited, the Fast Flying Virginian, and the Super Chief drifted into history or were later borrowed by Amtrak. So Stan was there and he might <laughs> share with you uh, one memory on that. What, was, what do you remember about that, Stan? In the stands, um, I remember vividly, went in the stands with my parents and they had a, um, had a you know, with a, like a, like a Bill Cody show type yeah. thing to out there. And this lady sitting next to me said, you know the name of that lake out there? And I said, no. And she said, <laughs> that's Lake Michigan. And she said, and then she recited the other four, right? And I, it, from that day, I knew all the names um, of the Great Lake. <laughs> is that how you became interested in the Wild West? Uh, perhaps. perhaps. I was, this was fantastic. The railroad fair because they had an exact full-scale reproduction of Fort Dearborn. Yeah. And uh, I wish I was not was that enthralled with the Old West history because I don't even know why Chicago never maintained a full-scale replica of the fort. Some they tore down the second Fort Dearborn, uh, I think in the 1850s. That's when it came down. Yeah. But they had that replica model in the Chicago History Museum. Yeah, but I think they took that down too. And finally, this last image of the Beatles coming to Chicago on September 5th, 1964, playing the amphitheater. And the interesting little side note to this story is that Colonel Jack Riley, who was Mayor Daly's uh, chief of events for many, many years, was worried about the security procedures and didn't want to tell the public which airport the Beatles were coming to fly into. So you had several hundred, maybe up to a thousand teenagers that went out to O'Hare and were disappointed. And then another contingency of them went to Midway and were behind the chain link fences. Uh, and actually many of these girls broke down the chain link fences and ran grant running towards the limousine. The Beatles were in the midst of a nationwide tour. It was an exhausting, grueling event. The night before, they had been in Milwaukee, uh, where there were disruptions and almost a riot in Milwaukee. And so Daly went to great lengths to ensure the, the security of this event. The Beatles gave a press conference uh, in the old stockyards in across from the amphitheater. And they asked, I think it was John Lennon, what he wanted to see the most in Chicago. And he said, a gangster. <laughs> so with that, I'll close. And if there are any questions or comments that what you may have, I'll be happy to answer them. So for whatever is there, we have 12 people joining us on Zoom. So if you want to ask a question, please use the microphone. Another quick question. No, please use the microphone. 
you know where um, Montgomery Ward lived? Uh, he as, and he lived in the Prairie Avenue section, uh, and, but he also had homes up, had a home up in Wisconsin, and then later up in the northern suburbs. He had quite a lavish estate in Wisconsin that he didn't visit very much. I think it was around Lake Geneva. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions, comments? Stan? I can go there. Gosh. We do have some questions that are coming in on the Zoom chat. Okay. That. Sure. Okay, this is why well, I got a number of questions, but I'm going to ask one. Do you, do you know what happened to all the photographs? Not photographs, but the uh, probably, well, they might have been photographs in the Sirloin Club at the Chicago Stockyards because they had a, like a Hall of Fame of all these famous cattlemen and so forth. And uh, John Clay and uh, Boss Mossman, and um, uh, there are many other many others. Maybe uh, John uh, McCoy, uh, but you know whatever happened when they tore down the stockyards, all that disappeared. And I well, the have any idea where the it stockyards is. stood until the mid 1970s. I think 1977 it was gone, and there were a lot of horse head portraits as well. The collection was worth a lot of money. And it was removed, but honestly, Stan, I don't know where it went. It might be in somebody's storage locker now. I don't know, but um, uh, there was—I think it was in the sirloin room in the name of the other name of the room in the famous room in the stockyards and escapes me. But uh, President Eisenhower had visited that. I mean, many celebrities ate at the stockyards. And did every anybody here ever eat at the stockyards? In I did. I met Mayor Richard J. Daly there. Did you? Yeah, the flower show. Was there in 1958? My, my dad knew the mayor somehow. He, he was with Governor Otto Kerner. He walked up to him. He says, Tom, I want you to be Mayor Daly. There it is. Hi, Tom. I said, Hi, Mayor Daly. I want you to be my friend. Mayor Daly said to me, I want you to be my friend Otto Kerner. I, bought, I shook both hands. And then Otto Kerner <laughs> became governor. It was right in 58. Yeah. yeah. I remember. I was at the atmosphere. Yeah, I, I remember going to some of the stockyard shows. Uh, it was held every year. Uh, I think the last one was in 1970, 71, and then it was transferred down to Louisville afterward, and then I don't know where it is now. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments from uh, the, the listeners on the outside? I was there. You were there? I was there. You were there? Uh, were you at, at I Park a year later. <laughs> right. They were, the Beatles were in... In, I think three years, 64, 65, and 66. Were you at Were you at Midway Airport? Or? Speak up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did you actually hear them sing, or was there nothing but screaming? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, four fifty was the price of the ticket. Five fifty. Because we were up in the bar. Oh. Oh. We had five kids oh. here. And they, four tickets we bought, and they actually sent by return mail four tickets with four $1 bills because the 550 tickets were sold out. They gave us such a lot of cash. They sent it to the other one. It was so bad. I think there were a couple of pictures that they were like this. Do we have the Zoom questions? Yeah. Um, bring them up here. Anybody else on Zoom want to ask a question? So that plaque you mentioned that's on Jackson Avenue and uh, in Chicago about the time zones and what's the corresponding street on Jackson? I think I remember years ago passing by it. I was wondering if you had a slide on it. There's also picked a plaque, I believe, at Union Station before you go into the Great Hall that speaks of the time zones too. I, I caught the part about the uh, the Union Station and the plaque, but I didn't. Did anybody hear, hear the rest of that? Oh, oh on, yeah, it's on it's on the wall uh, of of the of the bank on as you walk east. It's on the uh, north side of the street at Jackson and LaSalle. But, uh, yes, sir. Oh, you, you referred to Shenry. 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 Use the speaker. Chrome. Use my microphone. Oh, <laughs> You referred to Chef Jean Crohn's, yes. who uh, 
attempted to do the, well, did do the mass poisoning. You said he died quietly at home. Where was his home? Do you know? Do you know? Uh, it was in New Jersey, I believe. And uh, uh, it's in the book. Uh, but I mean, I, sometimes I don't remember everything that I write. <laughs> but, the, uh, but he did die quietly at home and uh, about 20 years after the poisoning. So All right, uh, thank you. he's the one that got away. Of course, a lot of, a lot of them get away. So I do have copies, of, uh, six copies of the book, if you are interested in it. It was published by Southern Illinois University Press. Uh, last summer, and uh, it was it won it recently won an award from the Illinois State Historical Society. Of course, uh, I serve on the board, so that might have been a, <laughs> that might that might have been a uh, Chicago deal, Chicago deal in the making, you know. But uh, do we have uh, any more Zoom questions or comments? Just a couple observations. Um, there was a play musical a few years ago about the Christmas ship. Yes. And somebody commented that they really enjoyed that, the musical. Yes, the, the musical really brought the story back to life. Uh, it had been forgotten and ignored for many, many years. But in the last 15 years, uh, the story has been resurrected. And it's just kind of a kind of a nurturing story of optimism and faith, and it kind of embodies the Christmas spirit in Chicago. Anything else? If you run out of books, how do we get one? <laughs> <laughs> well, the book is available through Amazon.com. Uh, it should be in Barnes & Noble, but if it's not, they can always order it. Uh, it's uh, These days, unless you're a... Uh, you publish with a big New York house, it's very hard for books to gain traction because the book review sections in newspapers are almost non-existent. And uh, although we have a flourishing literary community that has developed in Chicago in the last 10 to 12 years, we have the Chicago Writers Association, uh, the Printer's Roll Book Fair, which, book Fair, which is now called LitFest, is going to uh, reconvene. Uh, after a two-year hiatus, it's going to be in September of this year. So I urge all of you, if you haven't gone to that great book fair, it's one of the largest in the Midwest. And uh, it's kind of a gathering place for writers and book lovers. Uh, if there's nothing else, I, I want to uh, Denise, okay. who's still with us here, observed that the plaque to time zones is administration on the wall before going into the Great Hall. Oh, is, is there another one? Yeah, Denise, can you can you join us here? Oh, yeah, it's um, in that hallway uh, as you go towards the Great Hall. There's a plaque uh, talking about the time zones and the trains and stuff. It has a different format than the one you're talking about. I used to work downtown and come in at Union Station and walk down Jackson, so I know both plaques you're talking about. Uh, but I haven't seen that one, then, nor did I take a picture of it on the bank building. That's um, Bank of America, I think. Yes, the plaque was put up by the former tenant of that building, which was the Continental Bank of Illinois. And the Continental Bank had all kinds of scandals and misappropriations. And, uh, uh, and, that, and as a side note, that is a very interesting historical location because in 1919, the wing foot, which was a dirigible, crashed into the bank building, the original bank building that was there and killed a number of people. And then the Continental Bank had its scandals in the 1980s and 19, early 90s. And now uh, Wintrust is there. And after many years, Wintrust scratched away the Continental Bank, in, uh, in, which was inlaid in the cement above the main entrance on LaSalle Street, and they put up Wintrust. I don't think they wanted to occupy the bank building, and everybody would think that it was still a Continental Bank. Anything else or any other questions or, or comments? Further east, um, there were statues on the south side of the street very tall statues. And there was a story about them that they had been uh, borrowed by a bank executive for his lawn for many, many years. And then he finally gave them back to the city and they, they mounted it um, about, about three blocks north of what you're talking about, the plaque. Just yeah, by the Board of Trade Building. Right. 
right? I forget what the statues represented, but they yes, wanted to happen to it, but he had had it on his lawn and his estate someplace for a long time. There are two enormous uh, uh, statues, and I believe they were affixed to one of the downtown buildings. And when the buildings were demolished, they were removed to a private estate. They were rediscovered in a weed patch and brought back downtown, and they face each other right in the courtyard of the uh, of the uh, Board of Trade building, and they have a little plaque uh, explaining what they are. They, you know, in, in the concrete maze of buildings, you see these two elegant statues, and it's kind of an oddity in a way, but it's a piece of resurrected Chicago history. We did get a parting comment from Bobby Sloan. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much for a lot of memories and new information. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've, I, it's always a pleasure to come here. Uh, uh, I've done a, a lot of work and I've always been invited here and through your very gracious invitations and a chance to meet and greet everybody. My mother was on the board of the uh, NPHS many years ago and uh, yeah, she was. And uh, um, I love everybody here um, and I congratulate all of you on your fight to get this building the way it is today and looking the way it is. And Because other historical societies have folded. The Irving Park Historical Group is no more and it just relies on the support of its membership and uh, and the interest in preserving community history, because I think all history starts locally in the community. Um, and uh, we have done a marvel, you have done a marvelous job of preserving the history of Norwood and Edison and uh, Gladstone Mayfair. And uh, um, I, I sometimes think we are the kind of the ignored corner of Chicago. And some people say we like it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.